welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. Indie Alaska is a groundbreaking series that dives into the lives of people living in the last frontier. Each episode introduces you to colorful characters from around the state. Funding for Indie Alaska is provided in part by Alieska Pipeline Service Company. Catch the latest episodes at alaskapublic.org. It's never too early to set expectations and goals for your child's education. The UA College Savings Plan provides opportunities that can help you reach your educational savings goals. Save in Alaska. Study anywhere. There is more information available by calling 1-888, the number 4, and then Alaska. This message sponsored by the UA College Savings Plan. The National Weather Service. Good Wednesday, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. It's the 7th of October, and as always, we encourage you to stay up to date with your local weather information by going to weather.gov slash Alaska or calling the weather info line at 800-472-0391. You can find us on Facebook at NWS Alaska, and we'll have more information about some of the topics we'll talk about here tonight, including the increasing chance that there's going to be a lot of wind across southern parts of southeast as remnants of Hurricane Oho continue moving north and east away from Hawaii. You can always follow along on Twitter.com by using the hashtag AKWX, and we'd love for you to follow our accounts as well at NWS Juno, NWS Anchorage, or NWS Fairbanks. Even NWS Alaska will get you some of the same information. But one way you can share information with us, whether it's a storm report or just a pretty Alaska picture of the weather that you see over your house, you can use the hashtag AKWX, and that's very helpful to us as well. You can get daily afternoon map briefings on YouTube at NWS Alaska and NWS Anchorage. And again, look for the hashtag AKWX to help you out. Here's what's going on in your world. In southeast tonight, we have a high wind watch for some of the outer coasts around Heidelberg, southward and into the Dixon entrance, including areas around Ketchikan. The high wind watch will start on Friday morning and go through Friday evening. We're expecting winds there to be strong enough to uh, cause some minor damage there. Expecting winds at least from 40 to 50 miles per hour and some gusts upwards of 60. Again, that'll start around Friday morning and go into Friday evening. And the reason why is from what is now a hurricane. Oho is moving away from the Hawaiian Islands, which are seen here. Now, the present position as of earlier this morning at around uh, 1 o'clock Alaska time was about 1,800 miles south and west of Heidelberg. So quite a ways away. And you're saying, well, that's a large distance to cover between now and Friday. Yes, it is, but the jet stream is really going to help this move very quickly. 150 to 170 knot jet stream is going to catch parts of this and then zip it north and east very quickly starting on Thursday. So that distance will be closed fairly quickly tomorrow. Maximum winds earlier this afternoon were around 105 miles per hour. It was presently moving in northeast around 38 miles per hour, and the minimum central pressure is about 966 millibars, which had gone up since the previous update. And right about now, the tropical weather uh, folks out in the Pacific are updating this information. So if you update your web page now or get the latest update, however you like to get that, uh, it may be just a little bit different. This is as of a little bit earlier this afternoon. So here are the wind projections now. And again, this is from earlier information midday. You can see the deep red and the dark purples there showing that northeasterly trajectory. This is the hurricane force wind swath. We're not going to have to worry about that. But we may have to worry about tropical storm force wind gusts approaching the Dixon entrance, Haida Gwaii, and southern parts of southeast. That's the concerning part. And once again, by the time that storm system gets here, it will not be a hurricane, but it will have a lot of wind with it. And if you're thinking, this is a really kind of a strange weather pattern. This is not the type of weather pattern that we typically see in southeast. You would be right. This is pretty unusual. In fact, we had to go way back to 1975 when Hurricane Agatha made a curve similar to this. Again, this is uh, very uh, unusual to see this type of track, but here's Hawaii. 
Here's Alaska and southeast, and Hurricane Agatha made a similar track there back in 1975, so it's been quite a while. Now let's look on the other side of the ocean, in the western Pacific. This is a Choi Wan a typhoon that's working north and east away from Japan. And you can see this is already starting to fan out and lose its tropical characteristics. But there is another tropical-like system on the other side of the map here. As this moisture works northward, it is bringing some wet weather to the western Bering Sea and will continue to keep things fairly warm across the central and western Bering. In the meantime, a fairly potent weather system is already in the Bering, and this area of low pressure is keeping southerly winds going across south and western Alaska, decent westerlies moving across the central and eastern chain, and it's blowing a lot of wet weather into south and western Alaska at this point. So let's look at the Gulf of Alaska. We already have one weather maker working northward. This is not OHO. This is just a precursor to what's going on. Wet weather is moving into southern parts of southeast. It's moving into the Gulf Coast and southwestern Alaska and Kodiak. And this is going to make a lot of wind across the northern and western Gulf Coast as we go into tonight and into tomorrow. Storm force winds are expected across the Barren Islands and uh, across Shelikoff Strait. If you have plans on the ferry, uh, the Testamina, uh, hopefully very trusty again tomorrow for your trip there. If uh, conditions are still travelable there, they uh, will be a little bit of rough and tumble there. So just uh, tighten things down and hold on for a bumpy ride. Out across the central and western parts of the interior, clouds will continue to increase, but it doesn't look like there's a, really, a very good opportunity for a whole lot of wet weather north of the Alaska Range. Things will be cool. They may be breezy at times, but high pressure should win the day there. As you look at the weather map today, the low pressure system we already see in the Gulf is at 980 millibars, and out ahead of that is that warm and wet air that's working its way northward. The pressure gradient's tightening across the northern and western Gulf, and there's our low out across the Bering. It's trying to stay organized as best it can. It's got a lot of dry air wrapping into it. It's about 985 millibars and high pressure sitting just east of the Alcan border in the Northwest Territories with another stronger part of that ridge well north and west of Barrow. As you look at tonight, the system out across the central and western Gulf is deepening. It's down to 968 millibars. The front will move into southeast, south central, and southwestern Alaska. And as you know by watching a lot of these weather shows, you see this weather pattern shape up. Usually this frontal boundary starts to fall apart when it gets that expansive across the Gulf, and that will happen. Moderate to occasionally heavy rain is expected, and again, the winds will probably be the predominant feature across south central and southwestern Alaska and Kodiak Island. Southeast will get some rain, and across the Copper River Basin and some of the higher terrain, there might be a, a slight chance you'll get some rain and snow mixing together. And the same goes for areas around Kotzebue Sound, but as you'll see, most of the interior in western Alaska will see more clouds than anything else. For Thursday, it looks like you'll get a little bit of a break in some of the heavier rainfall in southeast as a wave of low pressure works from south to north. Across south central and southwestern Alaska, though, the pressure gradient will remain fairly condensed and tight across the Barren Islands and Kodiak Island in southwestern Alaska. If you're going to try and fly, plan on some low-level wind shear and some gap winds and probably enough for some isolated severe turbulence. So conditions won't be very uh, flyable uh, south of the uh, Kenai Peninsula to Kodiak Island. It's going to be pretty rough. And across southwestern Alaska, rain will be working through as the easterlies move off of the mountains there as the frontal boundary works through. And areas of light rain and drizzle and low clouds should be expected across the central and western Bering, as well as uh, parts of the middle interior where morning fog will be likely around the middle Tanana Valley. The pressure gradient will still be there. You might have some breezes shape up throughout the day, but more than likely it'll be a fairly dry day. And that continues into Friday with a drier patch of sky developing across the central and northern parts of the interior all the way to the Beaufort Sea Coast. But by Friday and southeast, that will not be the case. Uh, the remnants of Oho will have moved north and east. Again, thanks to the jet stream just zipping this right along. The low pressure system we estimate now will be around 967 millibars, and there will be some heavy rain with this. But once again, the winds will probably be the worst part of it. As that moves through the Dixon entrance and continues tracking north, uh, it looks like it will bring some of those higher winds potentially through the Heidelberg to Ketchikan area, and gusts could exceed 60 miles per hour in those regions. And mariners uh, take heed. Uh, you could see some uh, stronger winds there, not to mention uh, so thunderstorms in the region, as well as a convective weather throughout the day as the system continues to work through. So strong winds, periods of heavy rain, and probably some high seas in the region as this uh, works northward. On the back side of this, a 969 millibar low that keeps rain going around Kodiak, wind gusts going through the central and eastern chain in the Alaska Peninsula, and still most of the central and northern parts of the interior remain dry going into Friday. Now, 
what has happened. Temperatures in southeast were in the 50s and 60s today. Sitka around 60 degrees, uh, Skagway and Haines in the 40s and 50s. Southern parts of southeast, even with rainfall in the mid 50s there. 40s and 50s for Prince William Sound, 50 in Seward and Homer today. Kenai made it to 43, 42 in Anchorage and 46 around Talkeetna. It was 45 in Fairbanks and Eagle with 30 in Fort Yukon, 41 up around Bettles, 19 going over the road in Anaktuvik Pass, mid 20s for the Beaufort Sea Coast and 25 in Barrow. Wainwright saw temperatures in the lower 20s this afternoon, but just down the coast, Point Hope and Point Lay were in the 30s with Kotzebue Sound in the 30s and 40s today. Kivalina saw 41. Nome was 43. Norton Sound temperatures made it into the mid-40s today. 43 in Galena and 42 up the river in McGrath. 47 was the temp around Bethel with Nunavak Island showing 46. 43 in St. Lawrence Island. And southwest into Bristol Bay, we saw temps just shy of 50 degrees this afternoon. Low to mid 40s for the Pribilofs. The Alaska Peninsula had upper 40s to about 50 degrees in Sand Point. And mid 40s for Adak and Atka with Shemya calling in just below 50 degrees. Now, overnight low temperatures in southwest should hold above freezing. In fact, Bristol Bay temperatures may range in the lower 40s tonight. Same goes for the Alaska Peninsula and the chain. 40 in St. Paul, just shy of 50 in Kodiak. South Central, upper 30s and lower 40s with wet weather there. Mid to upper 40s for southeast, the outer coast in the lower to mid 50s. North of the Brooks Range, you'll be in the teens tonight. Most of the Arctic coast will drop into the mid 20s once again. Nome looking at 34 with a high of 43 tomorrow. The Arctic coast in the upper 20s with the middle Tananaw Valley back in the mid 40s as warmer air spreads your way. South and western temperatures in the low 40s to low 50s around Bristol Bay is some of the warmest there at 52 in Kodiak. South central also mild in the lower 50s and southeast you'll get a taste of that warmer tropical weather moving northward with highs back in the mid to upper 50s some places closing in on 60. Flying weather shows IFR, of course, along the Gulf Coast, Kodiak Island, around the Barrens, and the Prince William Sound side of the Kenai Peninsula, as well as areas north of the Alaska Peninsula into the Bering with MVFR conditions for mo most of the Arctic coast. Your pass conditions should improve for Anaktuvik and Attigan Pass throughout the day. Expect VFR by the end of the day there. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass, we expect marginal flight conditions for visibility during the daytime. Rainy Pass right now looks to be a little bit better. As we get into Windy Pass, expect visual flight rule through your Thursday. Isabel Pass should be okay. Mentasta Pass, we expect MVFR. And Tanita Pass, expect marginal flight conditions to develop there with Portage Pass leaning over toward IFR during your Thursday. And Chilkoot and White Pass at this point, we're going to call IFR for most of your Thursday. The freezing levels show a big difference across the eastern Gulf, the southeast, and the north and the west. Look at this. We have a pretty tight gradient here from 2,000 all the way up to 6,000 foot around the Yukon Valley in the central interior as well as southeast up to 8 to 10,000 feet. Uh, north of that, it's all cold, of course, with the surface freezing line dropping into the Copper River Basin and parts of the Matanuska Valley. As far as icing potential goes, we'll probably see a better chance of icing in the coming days for parts of south central and uh, maybe even the eastern interior. As it looks tomorrow, watch for light to isolated moderate across northern parts of southeast. There is a bulk of warm air moving northward with the system, of course. And across the west, look for a light to isolated moderate across the Yukon Delta all the way through the Kuskokwim Delta and into the lower parts of the Alaska Peninsula as well as South Central's coast with uh, some pockets of occasional moderate there with areas of lift and enhanced moisture working around that area of low pressure. Here's a jet stream and once again this is the reason, the number one reason why OHO is going to move so quickly from down around Hawaii to all the way up to southeast in about uh, 36 to 48 hours. Wind speeds rounding the western side of this trough are ranging from 125 to 170 knots. That is some super fast jet stream air. And as that zips around, that will grab that disturbance that is Oho and just zip it right up into southeastern Alaska, just like that. I can do that again. Just like that. Yeah, it's going to be fast. So out across most of Alaska, high pressures in command, but under the control of that trough, out across the Gulf of Alaska, that's what's driving our weather maker going into southeast. At 9,000 feet, we have that broad southerly flow going across the eastern Gulf. So no surprise, 30 to 40 knot winds there coming in, bringing more rain to southeast right now. But it's more of a continental flow for most of the interior with wind speeds between 20 and, uh, 10 and 20 knots for the interior, like Tan the Tanana Valley and out along the west coast, 20 to 30 knots there. It's a northerly wind for the central and western chain and low pressure sitting just south of Kodiak, driving in some stronger winds there at 40 knots. But those winds really pick up as you get to 3,000 feet. 40 to 55 knots there, so watch out for some isolated severe turbulence in this region from Cook Inlet all the way through Shelikov Strait and the Alaska Peninsula. 
For southeast, wind speeds there picking up to about 60 knots south and west of Sitka. Easterly winds continue for the interior, so dry conditions prevail there. Northeasterlies down the Chukchi Sea coast and northerlies for the central and western chain maintained at 20 to 30 knots. Turbulence, and no surprise like we were talking about, we're going to see some light to isolated moderate for most areas from, uh, say, Matanuska Valley all the way down toward Dutch Harbor. Don't be surprised to run into widespread moderate, and I would be even uh, less surprised to get reports tomorrow of isolated severe in that region. There will be some low-level wind shear and some pretty strong winds throughout the day, so again, be on your guard and be prepared. For southeast, watch for developing areas of occasional moderate in the inner channels and along the coast with worse conditions expected, of course, as we head into Friday as Oho approaches. And light to isolated moderate along the north slopes of the Brooks Range and some pockets of light to isolated moderate across the middle Tanana, middle Yukon Valley, I should say, St. Lawrence Island and Nunavak Island throughout the daytime below 4,000 feet. That's a look at your aviation forecast. I'll be back in just a few minutes with an update on the sea ice edge, your marine charts, and once again, a look at the surface weather. Stay tuned. What is it about the ocean that attracts so many of us? We like to play in it, get our food from it, build our houses near it, and gaze out at it. Our economy depends on the goods that come in and go out through our major ports. The ocean makes us feel good, contributes to our economic growth, and we like to be close to it. It's not surprising then that almost half of our population lives near the coastline, but working and playing along the coast is not always serene. Powerful coastal storms can raise the water level significantly, 20 feet or even more, causing loss of life, destroying homes, businesses, and property. Hurricanes like Katrina and Ike showed us firsthand the risk that coastal communities face. It was 32 feet. We went through the first floor to the second floor, through the attic. The water came up to us like here on the roof, and we talking about swimming to the tree. And luckily, it subsided. With ocean waters warming and sea levels rising, it is likely that the U.S. will encounter future storms equally as harmful and costly. And with so many people living along the coast, the stakes are getting higher each year. Storm destruction is rarely limited to lost lives and property. Instruments collecting water level and meteorological information must be located in harm's way so they can deliver data critical for flooding forecasts and emergency evacuations. But all too often, these stations are damaged or destroyed during the very times we need them. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, has responded to this dilemma by strengthening some of its storm tide stations. Known as NOAA Sentinels of the Coast, these platforms are single pile, four feet in diameter structures that stand at least 20 feet above the sea surface and are driven 60 to 100 feet into the seafloor for stability. For over 200 years, NOAA has monitored the rise and fall of tides using the latest technology. Beginning with human observers in the early 19th century, NOAA has harnessed technology to operate its network of tide stations that automatically collect accurate and reliable data every six minutes. Today, NOAA maintains more than 200 permanent water level observing stations. NOAA's goal is to ensure that the public has advance notice based on the most accurate and up-to-date storm tide and meteorological information. This is only possible, however, when the tide stations operate throughout the storm. So sentinels are designed to withstand a Category 4 hurricane with winds up to 155 miles per hour and storm surges of nearly 20 feet above normal. Planning, design, construction, and operation required a team of experts in surveying, engineering, pile installation, oceanography, quality control, and web expertise. With new technology, NOAA is better meeting the needs of coastal communities. Lives are often at stake during the 24 hours before a major storm. Once floodwaters begin to rise, it becomes critical to know which evacuation routes are passable. Having this kind of immediate real-time data up close 
that our community has access to is critical for us in our day-to-day -day operations. Each Sentinel will report real-time water level and meteorological observations. Water level measurements are precisely referenced to ensure that coastal communities can make informed decisions to elevate housing, build levees, and plan evacuation routes. In addition to storm tide reporting, the products that result from NOAA's instruments also contribute to safe navigation, accurate charting, marine engineering, sea level change monitoring, and other important activities. Before we send crews out, we always check the ties because being in South Louisiana, you have to make sure your, your barges and boats can get in before you can even begin your, begin your work. So the tide information is very important. The first Sentinels were constructed along the Gulf Coast at Calcasieu Pass, Amarada Pass, and Shell Beach in Louisiana, and Bay Waveland in Mississippi. Hurricanes Gustav and Ike tested the Sentinels within weeks of installation. Standing strong, they delivered storm tide data, which were used by emergency responders as well as thousands of coastal residents. More Sentinels are planned and will be built at exposed coastal locations as funding becomes available. Other stations in less exposed areas will be elevated above storm surge range on substantial structures. Coastal communities must be ever vigilant. Even tropical storms can deal a massive blow to many residents, especially storms that make landfall on a high tide. Sentinels are designed to serve the over 150 million residents of coastal communities, planning for the worst and hoping that we never need those plans. However, if the unthinkable happens, NOAA Sentinels will be there standing tall, providing a safe haven for instruments that are vital to planning for and responding to nature's fury. Sea ice continues to thicken up in concentration offshore. All the areas in white here are concentrations at or above 80 percent. The light blue uh, between about 20 and 80 percent there. And you can see the ice along the coast is starting to thicken up a little bit more as temperatures continue to drop. As long as the winds stay up in some of these areas, it will be a little harder for ice to form, but you can see it is beginning to uh, increase in coverage just offshore for sure. You can see the latest ice edge anytime at weather.gov. Thursday's marine forecast in southeast won't be as bad as what we expect on Friday. So watch this carefully if you're in southeast, especially southern southeast. Look for southeasterly winds from 35 to 40 knots with seas on the inside, 8 feet, 12 foot seas west of Craig and up towards Sitka. Those seas drop off to about 9 to 11 feet. Northerlies continue across the Lynn Canal with offshore winds from the Cross Sound region and Gustavus all the way to Yakutat. Friday's the big day. There will be higher gusts. A high wind watch for the land areas and the marine areas should expect some warnings as well with winds well above gales and into storm force conditions there uh, potentially higher with higher gusts at least to 85 knots in some of these areas on top of thunderstorm activity possible especially for the outer coast. Look for winds from 50 to 60 knots there on the inside of Clarence Strait and then south of Sitka along the outer coast with seas from 26 to 32 feet Northerlies opposing that through the Lynn Canal and Stevens Passage at 35 knots. North and easterly winds out of Cross Sound and Gustavus at 35 knots and northwesterlies coming down from Icy Cape. Friday's not going to be a nice day on the water or on land, especially in southern parts of southeast. I'll also add in some heavy rain and again the threat for thunderstorms there. So pay attention to the weather in southern southeast with the remnants of Hurricane Oho moving north and east. For Thursday in South Central, this is our windy day in the Barren Islands region as well as the Shelikoff Strait area and down Cook Inlet winds from the north and east 40 to 50 knots, seas from 13 to 19 feet and then across the western Gulf 35 to 45 knots with an easterly wind bringing seas up from 14 to 18 feet inside of Prince William Sound 20 knot winds with a four foot sea. Friday things drop off with uh, winds from the north and east down Cook Inlet from 10 knots to 35 knots inside of Shelikoff Strait. Seas there still at 13 feet. An easterly wind coming into the Barrens at 25 knots uh, outside of Resurrection Bay, 20 knot winds with a 9 foot sea and northerlies fall off inside Prince William Sound to 10 knots with a 2 foot sea. 
For the Alaska Peninsula and around Bristol Bay, northeasterlies coming through Bristol Bay at 35 knots with an 8-foot sea. Northerlies a little bit further down the coast. North and easterly winds coming down the Pacific coast with 40 knots with a 10 to 14-foot sea. Uh, the flow changes a little bit on Friday with more of an easterly wind inside of Bristol Bay. Northerlies coming off of Sand Point and King Cove at 30 knots with a 9-foot sea. And southeasterlies from Castle Cape all the way to Chignik with a 30-knot wind and a 9-foot sea there on Friday. Northwesterlies are in charge of the Aleutians as we go through Thursday with 15 to 30-knot winds along the Bering Sea coast, 20 to 35-knot winds across the Pacific coast, and northwesterlies from Kiska to Attu with a 14 to 16-foot sea on Thursday. That becomes more of a northerly flow in the west with seas falling off to 12 feet. Northwesterlies continue for the central and eastern chain at 25 to 30 knots on Friday. For the west coast, northerlies for St. Lawrence Island all the way to the Pribilovs, 25 to 30 knots all areas with 7 to 9 foot seas on Thursday. Uh, the flow doesn't change very much on Friday, still looking at a northerly wind at 25 to 30 with seas ranging from 9 to as high as 14 feet west of St. Matthew. For the North Slope, look for a north and easterly wind to continue with areas of freezing spray again for the Beaufort Seacoast and the Chukchi Seacoast, 30 to 35 knots with 8 to 12 foot seas in the west and 4 foot seas in the Beaufort. As we get into Friday, look for a northeasterly wind to continue, 15 to 20 in the Beaufort and 30 to 35 for the Chukchi Seacoast, 9 to 13 foot seas in the west with 4 to 5 along the Beaufort Seacoast. Continuing our coverage of uh, the remnants of Hurricane Oho, uh, the system will continue tracking north and east, but this is a player that's already in place across the Gulf of Alaska tonight with 968 millibar low, though, spreading rain and wind across the north and eastern coast. The heaviest rain and wind probably around Kodiak Island and south central. Areas of light rain across the Bering and the chain, generally dry conditions for the interior. This wave will spread westward and sit in the western Gulf for tomorrow. Rain will continue for parts of southeast, but as we get into Friday, a high wind watch begins for the southern parts of southeast. Uh, 967 millibars, the remnants of Hurricane Oho now will quickly steam north and east and be in place across the eastern gulf by the afternoon with that strong winds, isolated thunderstorms, as well as high seas and probably some heavy rain will be possible in the region. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service.